welcome to your intended message. My guest today is Andrew Churchill. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Andrew. He One, he is fascinated by how communication works, and I'm also guessing by probably how it Sometimes it doesn't work. We'll, we'll look at those. Two, he's worked at the intersection between education and the rest of the world for his entire professional life. And three, he, he's a tinkerer. He likes to tinker, fix, and build things. Perhaps we'll explore uh, uh, what, what his latest project is. Andrew Churchill, welcome to your intended message. Thank you, George. Excited to be here. Delighted I, to be as as you were doing the intro, talking about communication, thinking about what works and what doesn't. Intended message, unintended message, right? And and that's really when when you invited me on your podcast, and and I saw the title of intended message is exactly what I thought about right away. Said I bet he talks about unintended messages as well. You bet. Yes, yeah. When we communicate, uh, for sure, and, and and I'm sure you 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 can affirm this that uh, we we send, like it or not, we send. We try to send our intended message. We also send a lot of unintended messages, and we and 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 the other challenge is we don't know how they're perceived. And and exactly. and it's it's funny. I just re I received um, received an email uh, a couple days ago, and the first time I read it, I thought. Hmm. This and it's a friend of mine, um, and uh, and I thought this person sounds angry. Are they angry at me? How do I respond? And here I am, two days later, and I still haven't responded. Still because haven't responded. <laughs> it's the it's really it's the challenge with um, electronic message, right? It's one of the reasons that we're seeing such a growth in uh, video and and audio messaging, rather than straight text messaging. So, so uh, companies like Volley, for instance, that are that are video messaging based, but asynchronous, short, so like a text message, but a video. Because if that had been a video message, you'd know whether he was mad at you or someone else, or wasn't even mad at all. It just happened to come out that way. And and you're right. Yeah, if we're looking at someone, we can say, "Hey, hey, he's smiling. He's joking. He's kidding." And and yeah, so I'll play along with him. Or whereas if we read the text, and you know, it's not the full text; it's one or two words that jump out at us and bite us, and we go, "Ooh, you can't say that to me." <laughs> and what and it, what is what does this part mean? Why do I not feel good reading this? I was, um, we can, we can actually segue a little bit, um, right into the engineering work if you want, where I had a, um, I'm doing, so I, so I run the training program for the three minute thesis competition for McGill university. So the, the challenge is actually an international competition. A lot of universities are doing it now. And the challenge is as an academic, how do you present your research to people in three minutes? Um, that aren't in your discipline. So how do we go from the technical, unfamiliar world of my work so you can understand me and understand what I'm doing? And um, the three-minute thesis competition, it's, it's a lot of feedback workshop-based. So iterate, right? So they do a practice session, get feedback on it, and then do another one and give feedback and do another one. As you know, um, you know, how do you get better? Will you practice? But intentional practice, not just any old practice. And, and the intended message part um, is really interesting here because what I do for feedback, that's really different from what most people do. Most people, when they give feedback, they talk about body language or they talk about the use of voice or they talk about the actual script or, and then they teach people how to give feedback. Like you see these rubrics, did they make good eye contact? And then you have non-professionals rating, whether like they're trying to give feedback on each other. I throw all that stuff. So what do you, like if you want 
prof- if you want professional advice, go to a professional. You wouldn't go to a you like you wouldn't come to me if you wanted medical advice. Yeah, it says doctor before my name, but I'm not a medical doctor. Um, but but so why are you going to your friend for presenting advice? Um, but but you can get wonderful feedback, and the feedback you can get is what was your received message. So we know what our intended message is, as long as we're being purposeful about communication. What we don't know is what's the message the audience received. So so the way I run feedback sessions is the presenter presents and then turns their microphone off. And the audience has a conversation. This is the trial audience, right? So we do this in breakout rooms. So the presenter presents and then has to turn their mic off. And then the audience has a conversation about what they heard. What'd you like? What'd you not like? What did you understand? Like one person tries to tell, one person tries to say what they said. So George, if you were presenting, I would have you present. And then if we had six or seven other people here, say, okay, George, turn off your mic now. And then I'd say, Stephen, what did George say? And Stephen would talk for a little bit and then get stuck somewhere. And I'd say, does anyone else understand? Like, Susan, do you understand what, like Steven's a little stuck. Susan, can you help him out? Susan would try and help out. And then I would ask people how they felt. And then I would ask people what they wanted to hear more about. Those three questions. What do you want to know more about? How did you feel? And What did the person actually say? Those are three pieces of feedback gold for understanding what the message actually was. Not the intended message, but the received message. Um, And then people can go back and iterate because now they know what people heard. And based on what they heard, they can now go back and revise and edit and try again. And then eventually you start to narrow that gap. Intended message, received message, intended message, received message, intended. As you iterate, that gap gets closer and closer and closer. And there's the, there's, um, you know, the things I like to focus on are, are, are the technical aspects of it. We could talk a little bit about that, but also the feeling of it. How do people, how do people feel? Because I think those are, um, we, we don't, especially technical presenters. So people like engineers who they, they don't necessarily think, how's my audience going to feel about this? <laughs> but it's really important to think about that. Why, why is that so important? <sighs> well, one is it tends to be what people remember. So, so if you ask me six months from now, um, I can probably, so, you know, I really liked, I really liked talking with George on his podcast. He, he made me feel great. He made me feel valued. He made me feel like I had something to contribute. Um, well, what did you guys talk about, Andrew? I don't really don't remember that much of what we talked about, but I, but, but you should go on his podcast. It's a great experience that that's actually often in the long run, what people remember. There's a great, Maya Angelou has a great quote about it. She says, it's all anyone ever remembers. I'll never remember what you said. They'll only remember how you made them feel. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece is, um, If you don't make people feel curious, they're never going to stick around for the rest of the story. (laughs) So there's just, you got to make people feel, you, you, you have to, you have to somehow ignite curiosity in that opening minute. You, you, you have people's attention for a little while, but then everybody very quickly Everybody has one of these in their pocket. (laughs) 
And if you don't make them curious to hear the rest of your story, they're going to go look at their email mm. or check their social media feed. And, and everybody says we're, we're less, uh, uh, you know, lots of people say, oh, we're, we're more likely to do that than we used to be. I don't really buy that. I used to, like, I remember when I went to university classes and this was long before cell phones and, and like, I always had a novel or a sports illustrated in my fold, in my binder. Or like I had a magazine or a novel as well as paper to take notes. And as soon as the lecture got boring, I started reading my magazine. It's no good. Like, I mean, yeah, these beep at us. These are designed to, like, it's a little different, but it's not, it's not that different. I mean, a lot of the things I concept. So I talk about connection, comprehension, and credibility. George, you probably immediately recognize those as logos, pathos, ethos, right? Mm, mm. <laughs> Communication's not changing very rapidly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we have a microphone now and an electronic mm. screen, but, but, but the way humans relate to each other, the things we remember, the things that draw us in, our capacity to remember. One of the things I'm one of the things I'm always talking with people is it's not you don't have to dumb it down, but you can't give us a lot of detail. Because we can't remember a lot and we can't process a lot. So so it's not so when people say don't use jargon, I always say don't use technical words, use plain language. I don't think, I, I don't actually think that's, so, so here's, a, here's maybe a controversial take. Academics should use technical language. They should use plain language too, but they shouldn't shy away from the language of their field. They should teach it to us. They should bring us to their language. So, because plain language doesn't work. There, you know, there, there needs to be a plain language um, introduction because we need to get there. But once we're in your lab, if you have 10, 20, 30 minutes with us, you can teach us a lot. Even in 10 minutes, you can teach us a lot. So the, the technical language is the point of using the technical language to reinforce that you are a technical expert and, and you and, and and you have credibility. However, there there must be a balance between how much technical language and when you introduce technical language. Do you stop and explain what it means? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> so, so you can't do very much. And, and this is the, this is really one of the, the primary themes, right? If you're, if you're doing a technical talk with a non-technical audience, um, I think about it. So I also do pitch coaching. And um, in the pitch world, we call it takeaways, right? But, but there's no reason not to. I mean, one of the things I do, right, is I bring business language into the academic world. Academics are like takeaways. That sounds like a business pitch. I'm like, well, guess what? Your presentation's a pitch. <laughs> you may not think about it that way, but you should. Um, and what are the takeaways? Can only have two or three takeaways because people can't remember very many things. People can remember a story which is why stories are so important. People can remember two or three takeaways, but, but not more than that. So you need to figure out what they are. So, so last year, we're in this three-minute thesis space. We might as well stay there. Last year, the person who won the three-minute thesis competition was um, doing spinal simulation, spinal surgery simulation. And he introduced the talk with something we're familiar with, 
What kind of simulators are we familiar with? Uh, if I say simulator, what comes to mind? Flight simulator? Flight simulator, exactly. That's where he started. Imagine you're on an airplane and there were no flight simulators and you knew that your pilot had never flown in a storm and you see lightning. <laughs> he says, hey, this is cool. I've never been in a storm before. At which point you're sweating and wish you weren't on the plane, right? Um, and then he says, well, if spinal surgery, guess what? If it's your spinal surgeon's first surgery, he's, there's no simulator. He's done it on a cadaver, but dead tissue doesn't feel like live tissue. And the problem is something called haptic feedback. So haptic feedback, a flight simulator, right? There's a yoke and you pull it back and forth. We all know that. And, and as it resists pulling, that's haptic feedback. So you pull, it resists. It's not pulling air, it's pulling, and, and that's the haptic feedback, is that back and forth. Problem with spinal surgery is it's very, very small, and the difference between tissue and nerve and bone and blood vessel and is minute. So it's very, very difficult to do spinal surgery simulation because the, the technology has to be much more precise. But guess what? I figured out how to do it. Mm. So, so the only word there that you didn't know was haptic. And I taught you what haptic means. And now you can remember spinal surgery, haptic feedback's the problem. It's minute little movements. And he's figured it out. And then the end of the talk, he actually spins back and, and says something like, so I want to bring this to market. So you or someone you love goes to spine sur surgery. You'll know that that person is as well-trained as an airplane pilot. Mm. Like, of course we want them to be yes. that well-trained. <laughs> We're talking about emotion. How do you make people feel? Yes. The audience like wants to jump up and start clapping. Hallelujah, right? Like, yes, of course they should be, right? So, so what are we, what are we trying? And that yes of, of course we want them to be is it gives us the, the, um, the energy, the desire, the need to share this with other people. Guess what? Your spinal surgeon doesn't do simulators and we should be doing them. And that's what you want, right? You want your audience to become, you, you, you want, in this particular case, you want your audience to become supporters of, of the work and the message. So, so that, that little story there um, wraps up a lot of things. It, it, it's simple, the takeaways, right? There's a story, there's an emotional connection. And, and those, are, those are the pieces we're trying to play with um, when, we, when we try and present technical information to a non-technical audience. So it's not just about definitions and explanation. The worst thing you can do is sound like a Wikipedia article. And most people start with a Wikipedia article worth of information, which is fine. That's, the, that's what the whiteboard's for. You put, the, you put that information on the whiteboard, then you figure out what you want people to remember, and then you figure out how to tell it in a way that people are going to become curious and motivated to listen and, and then you try and finish in a way that people are going to be motivated to do whatever you're hoping they'll do after. And Andrew, I notice um, at least three important parts or elements to that, that presentation from that person. They started with they started with something we know or at least are familiar with, the flight simulator. And they related that to the spinal surgery. So they made a connection because if they just started in with spinal surgeon, we'll go, huh? 
We, we don't know. We don't, don't know anything about that. Uh, but they made that connection. So they started where we know. They made a connection, made us curious, introduced only one technical word, which which then was explained, which now goes in our memory, and, and we might feel good. Hey, I learned a new word today, haptic. I even know what it means. I can use it in a sentence. It's like, you know, when, when you're stirring the soup and you feel that resistance, that's haptic feedback. You know, the right thickness of your stew. <laughs> oh, that's a great analogy. It's perfect. See, it worked. The mm -hmm. intended message was received because now George can explain haptic feedback. Mm -hmm. And what's what's also important is that the person will translate that message into something that means something to them that they can. And, and that's when you know you've gotten to that's when you know if you've delivered well. And then ending with that emotional appeal, imagine, you know, when your, your family, someone you love, a friend, good friend, you know, wouldn't you want them to have the best surgery possible if they have to go under the knife? And of course, and it so it makes that emotional appeal. What a what a what a fabulous way to convey a technical message. Yeah, I I um, it's so important to figure out how to start where your audience is. So I have this. I have a a couple of. Um, graphs of this where where I do this work with people. Um, and one is a, a picture of a coffee shop over here and a picture of your research lab here <laughs> and, a, and a big question mark in between. <laughs> How do I get there? <laughs> and, and a reminder that you have to go to them. It's not them coming to you. They're coming to your talk, but, but you have to start your presentation in a place that they can understand. And, and they're, they're going to be curious about and they're going to want to learn more. I, I, I paused there for a moment because I was like, ooh, that's not always true. Because because all of these things have exceptions to the rules. Sometimes we actually start purposefully with something that people won't understand because it triggers curiosity and they desperately want to. And then the rest of the story is explaining it. So we may, we, but, but that's the exception, right? Um, and, and the rule here is make people want to learn more, make people want to listen to you. So, so people come to your presentation with they they come prepared to be interested and then in that opening minute um i think they make three decisions one is um are you interesting like is this like do i like listening to you we'll talk about that later when we when we talk about vocals we can we can talk about an aspect of that right um so one are you going to be interesting to listen to Two, is your topic going to be interesting to listen to? Like, is there, is there something here that's important? Is there something here that I want to know more about? Sometimes it's why, Simon Sinek, right? Why? Start with why, but not always. Um, sometimes it's just something that makes me curious. There's an old M, there's a, there was an old NPR show, I think. I think it was NPR. The rest of the story, right? And, and that that was just curiosity, right? It wasn't always important, but man, did I want to hear the end of that story. Lots of times it actually wasn't particularly important, but I still heard the rest of the story because that was the way it was framed. Um, and then the third one, and the third one I think people don't pay enough attention to is, and it's particularly in the academic space, Am I going to be, so there are a couple of ways I think about this. One is, am I going to be cared for by this presenter? And because we all want to be no need, no needed cared for, right? That's part of the human existence. But, but this cared for piece is really about, am I actually going to be able to understand them? <laughs> like, am I actually going to be able to understand this? 
Because a lot of times when we come to an academic talk or an academic presentation, that's actually our, our fear. Like, oh yeah, they were really interesting. What they were talking about was really important. I can't understand a damn thing they're saying. So guess what? I'm checking out. I'm going to my phone. Self-defense. If I don't think that I'm going to succeed in understanding you, I'm going to protect my feeling of um, intelligence by not trying. I'm only going to try to understand you if I think I'm going to be successful. And that's a mistake people make. People don't. People don't pay enough attention to that. The am speaker of the listener. Am I making my audience feel like they're going to be able to come on this journey with me? Am I making them feel safe? Am I, am I giving them the confidence? Yeah, we're going to go to technical places, but don't worry. You're going to be able to understand it. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it does. And I'm, I'm guessing, so I'm guessing that a listener makes their decision to listen or not listen quickly at the beginning. And, and so the beginning of, of the talk, of the pitch, of the presentation becomes critical because I'm, I'm going to give you so many seconds and if you haven't caught my attention or I'm not understanding what you're saying or it feels like you're rambling, I'm a, I'm, I shut down. Whether I, I might still be in the room, but my mind is somewhere else. And, and so that means that that opening piece must take a lot of attention and must present a lot of difficulty for technical people who want to get into the weeds. And, and so how do you help them overcome that? How do you help them how do you help them make that transformation at the beginning of wait a minute, put your ego aside and think about your audience. And by the way, they don't have your training, right? They don't have your training and they don't have your expertise. And, and you, this is the, so, so part of the takeaway piece is not like, not, okay, what are all the things I want them to know? Well, yeah, you like, you'd like them to know everything about your lab and everything that you do. Cause we all like people to understand everything about us. Right. Cause we're very interested. <laughs> um, but, but what do they need? So, so I always say, I always get people to do an exercise of a worksheet for them that, that says, okay, four takeaways, two general, two specific, two in general about your area, your field. So, so if we go back to Trevor's, um, what's general there? Well, general there is, um, Spine surgery is much more technical to simulate than airline simulation. That's a general. Specific is because of this issue of haptic feedback. And then he gets into the actual precision of it. You know, the, there, there's some number, I'm, I'm forgetting it, but it's, you know, spinal surgeons have the capacity to be like 10 times more precise with their digits than the rest of us mere humans because they train it, they train precision. And they, and they have like their brains develop differently and they, cause they train over time, right? So, so their actual capacity for precision is 10 X the rest of us mere mortals. And that has to be captured. So it's not just how precise I can be, it's how precise a spinal surgeon can be, which is a lot more precise than me, right? Um, that's really specific. So think of a couple of things. I like to say two and two. And then I like to say, okay, people can only remember three things. So you have to delete one of those four. I thought you gave me four, Andrew. No, no, no. I didn't. But now you have to delete the least important one. <laughs> and, and that's it. You can give more detail. And you should give it. It doesn't mean you can't give more detail, but it does mean people won't remember more detail. Mm. So what are the details you want them to remember? And, and remember, people are only going to, um, if you want someone to remember something, in general, you have to say it at least three times. 
so so if you want people to remember the issue of haptic feedback you got to say haptic feedback at least three four or five times during your three minute presentation the other details just say once because then what's happening is we get these details right they're coming at us but then we get haptic twice we're like ooh, and then we get it a third time and a fourth time and that's the one that we remember the other ones came through us the other ones we needed to understand the story but we don't remember them we remember the ones you highlight and one of the ways you highlight it is through repetition um so you so you build that in what do i want people to remember and you don't build in exactly the same phrasing every time but you come at it a little differently right like if you're building a value proposition in a in a pitch for a startup that value proposition it's got some foreshadowing in the beginning it's got some explicit statement and it's got and it's there in the close right so it's coming in two three four times it's there it's never more than a sentence or two away from what we're talking about when we're talking about other details and it doesn't mean we don't do the other deep like we we do need to do the other details it's not about deleting all the details but it's about being very strategic and only choosing to highlight the ones you need and deleting way more than you think the more you can delete the more likely people are to to understand and and stay with you there're two i i think there're two things that go on there at least I think about this two ways. It'd be interesting to see if, if this resonates for you. Um, one is a concept I call cognitive overload. Whereas you give me things, eventually I can't take anymore. I'm done. And then I shut down. Um, and then the other one is um, a concept that I, th I think of as false focal point i give you a detail you think it's important it's not so i've created a false focal point because you're going to you pick up on things as you listen you're like oh that's interesting but if it's not important if it's not central but it's interesting i've actually undermining myself because I've created interest in something that's not what I'm talking about. It's not critical to what I'm talking about. And, and is that reinforcement, Andrew, that just because something's interesting doesn't mean it should be in our presentation? Most of the things that are interesting shouldn't be in our presentation <laughs> because okay. they create these false focal points. Only the ones that are interesting and get us to where we want to go should make it that's why presentations presentations are strategic communication they're not just us talking they're us being strategic incredibly strategic because we've spent hours and hours thinking about what's going to go into this five minutes or this 10 minutes it's not a good, like you and I are having a conversation now. We're I, I'm being a little strategic and stuff that I'm bringing in, but I'm but I'm but I'm doing it in the moment. Presentation, you're doing all this work ahead of time, and and um, yeah. So the so the question the question is always, um what's going to be curiosity and igniting what's going to be interesting what's going to make people want to learn more but also useful <laughs> mm. and that's why i always try and find three or four completely different like when i'm working with people like we get something that we think is going to work i'm like okay let's put that off to the side let's try again try and build a whole nother talk. So not airplane simulation, um, but let's do stirring soup and haptic feedback on stirring soup because everybody's had that, not everybody, but lots of people cook. So, so if you cook and you, and you stir things, 
you know there's like you're making gravy you can you can feel the gravy start to turn into the consistency that you want it to be which is not water but it's also not gloop <laughs> right <laughs> true <laughs> and 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 would that work maybe we can try it um it didn't the flight simulator ended up being better so so we went with the flight simulator <laughs> But it wasn't because the it wasn't because it was the first thing that was thought. It's rarely the first thing. That opening, I I almost never work with someone that the the way they propose opening at the end of the day is the way they end up doing it. And it's not because I'm smarter than they are and I gave them a better way. It's because we had a conversation and and over time and organically something appeared. There was like this moment of like like someone sitting there in the shower thinking about like and they're like, "Oh my god, I could do this." <laughs> and it and it works. They're like, "Yeah, you could and that would be brilliant." And and that rarely happens on command. So the whiteboard's really useful for getting all the information there. The whiteboard's useful for for creating potential paths. But the whiteboard's also useful because the whiteboard creates an image and and ideas that sit in the back of our brain. And instead of sitting in the brain as a text script, they sit in the brain as infinite possibility. And then we go do something else and we have that aha moment where the whiteboard suddenly oh my god i know it like ah. <laughs> and then it works mm. uh, so it sounds like we, uh, uh, we we need to start with some form of chaos to stimulate our thinking and create order is that fair? And and, and that, that came to me, and, and I haven't said that before, but that came to me when you're describing this process, and I could see, it, it, because that's pretty much the way I work. I, I work on a, on a flip chart, and when right. I'm designing, you know, I put things down, and then I pick up a different color marker, and I put different words in different colors, circles, boxes, and arrows, and then go back and cross out things that, okay, it's a good idea. I'm not going to use it this time. It doesn't fit here. Right. It doesn't fit. Mm. Yeah, I think that's right. The only thing I would, the only adjustment I might make is often that initial chaos is actually not chaos. So, so for academics, it's often the journal article they wrote. It's the way they would communicate with in their professional peer groups in the written word. So there's an introduction, there's background, there's there's a hypothesis, there's a methodology, there are results, there's a discussion, there's an analysis, and it all can go up there on the whiteboard in the different pieces or on the flip chart. And then the and then the chaos becomes when when instead of the regular flow, you actually put boxes around each one of those things and you start moving them around. And you have, you know, those little, um, it reminds me, you know, those little um, four by four grids with one missing box. And it's like, there's a house and you have to build the house. You move everything around. It's, it's like that where, okay, it's the journal article looks like a house. But, but for an interesting presentation, you might actually want to have it look like a dog. <laughs> And if you move all the pieces around, it'll look like something different that's a little unfamiliar, that's a little, that, that, that that's then the chaos. So you move everything around and, and then something new appears that's, that's different than what is most often there. So I don't, does that make sense? It does. Yeah. There's, and, a, there's and definitely a chaos moment. I, and and it and which must be difficult for 
a structured uh, technical person to make that crossing <laughs> through that 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 which is something that you help them. And and Andrew, for people who would like to know more about what you do and your programs, where's the best place to reach you? Where, where can they find you? So two places to reach me. One is if you're internal to McGill, you can reach me through McGill because that's where I work out of. <laughs> but for the rest of everybody, I'm, the best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn, Andrew H. Churchill. So there's an H in the middle. And um, I try and post three or four times a week, sometimes five times a week. And 90% of the time I post about the kinds of stuff we've been talking about today, about presentations, about presenting, about pitching. Sometimes I post randomly about something I'm tinkering with. <laughs> mm, mm. And we'd like to- I like building stuff and I like sharing that with people. So my latest, my latest project I've been sharing because it's January here in Canada, is my ice rink. Because I build an ice rink in my backyard, which is really fun. Mm. And and uh, and I imagine your your daughter enjoys that uh, having having her own private ice rink. Yeah, she's got her own private ice rink, and and uh, she now helps me build it. Right. Oh. Right? So when she was three or four, she didn't help me build it, but now she's out there with the with the uh, little electric drill as we put boards up, putting screws in and laying plastic down and figuring out, oh, this high needs to be a little higher on the wall than the other and thinking about how do we, how do we build stuff? How do we put stuff together? Mm. And I'm guessing there, there's a lot of similarity between what she's learning to do there and what you're teaching engineers and, and technical people in their presentations. Yeah, I mean, I I think of everything as a puzzle to build. Mm. <laughs> so, the chaos that you reference of like, okay, how do we how do we get the information together in a package that people will be interested in hearing all the pieces, and will get us somewhere that they'll be interested in doing something that would be helpful. That's the strategic part. What do we want people to do at the end? It's just a puzzle. That's the way I think about it. The communication mm. puzzle. Um, and then we beta test it. So then we then we ask people what they heard, and we get back to that intended message piece. Mm. A good note to wrap up on, Andrew. My guest today is Andrew Churchill, reminding you that people remember not necessarily the facts. They remember how they felt about you. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you convey your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.